All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's it's an honor to to be presenting to um, to the Field Naturalist Club. Um, I've actually followed you all quite a lot. Um, I've still yet to come on a, on a trip with you all, but um, I hope to do so soon. Maybe um, I'll join you all for that Mara field trip coming up. Um, and yeah, today, so I'm going to try to like walk you all through um, the fascinating geography and geology that we have of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, uh, as you said, um, the last time you had a talk like this was by Philip Parfan. Um, I've worked quite a lot with Philip and I, I love his passion. Um, I, would, I looked at his talk and listened to it and I thought I would probably try to give you a different spin on the, um, on the geography and geology of Trinidad and um, probably like uh, end off with a, with a sort of story that, that he gave um, in, in throughout his, um, his talk of the evolution of the, of the place, right? Um, so what I got in front of you over here to start with is a really nice um, three-dimensional sort of picture of um, Trinidad's geology. Um, with all of the colors depicting different land, um, different types of rocks of different ages and stuff. And maybe we should start by saying, well, what actually is geography and, and geology to start with and how are they really different from each other, right? Um, I think of geography as like, you know, trying to understand the earth, try to understand uh, the phys especially physical geography because there's human geography and physical geography as well, right? The physical geography is for us as humans, we're just inquisitive to try to understand the space around us, right? And, uh, and so, yeah, geographers um, look at, you know, mountains, rivers, coastline features, those kinds of things, right? Geology and geologists pretty much do the same thing, but we add one other element to that three-dimensional picture. We add time. Right, so basically geologists are basically looking at the earth, but through um, different time periods, right? So we look at the rocks that are present in this area, the rocks that are making up the mountains and the valleys and, and all of those kinds of things and try to put an age to these things and try to picture what the world, or in our case, our islands, looked like at that point in time, right? So it's, it's really that, um, that and, and that's one of the reasons why um, I, I like the, the, um, the slogan that the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago has, which is the, past, the present is the key to the past, right? So we look at what we have today and we can try to understand what may have, have occurred in the past using examples from today. To start off, I think we should look at the whole Trinidad and Tobago area from, you know, from a nice map view standpoint, stand back and like look at the whole space and understand that, um, that you know, we're quite an interesting piece of, of this planet, right? We, we have um, some, some mountain ridges running across the island. So we have three ridges in Trinidad, basically the Northern Range, Central Range, Southern Range. We have the main ridge in Tobago as well too. Um, but each of these ridges are all actually a bit different from each other, right? And so as a geologist, we start to wonder, well, why? Why are they different from each other? Are they made up of different types of rocks? Are they of different ages? Um, why are, why are some higher or some lower than the other, right? Um, so some things to point out, you know, there's some interesting things even below the water. Between Trinidad and Tobago, I mean, we think that, you know, um, Tobago is not that far away. And, you know, at some point in time, there may have been like bridge, land bridges and stuff between us. Yeah, the maximum water depth actually between these islands is just about 120 meters, right? And if you put things in perspective, at some point in time, sea level may not have been as high as it was now. It may have actually been lower than that. So there is a possibility that the entire place could have been you know, connected in some way or the other. There are areas offshore on the, on the, on the east coast, we call it Emerald Shoal. You may have heard the name. 
right? It's actually an area of very, very shallow water. The waters get really nice and turquoise and stuff. And that's actually an extension of our central range. So it actually is uplifted just like the central range and it just extends offshore. It just happens to be below the sea right now, right? And then you have a very shallow um, area in the Gulf of Paria area over there. It's very, very shallow. Whereas when you get towards the islands there, it gets quite, um, quite deep, quite channelized. So it's telling you about, you know, there's a rush of, of waters through these areas. You can feel it when you go on the boat trips through that area, you feel that rush, right? And that, uh, that added energy helps to basically carve the seabed in that area and create those, um, create those, those um, canyon systems inside there. To the north area here, over here, we have a nice broad shelf area that we refer to as the Patao um, Taraklita Basin. So we look at the geology of that area in a bit. And we have the Northern Range um, where we have like Eastern part is uplifting at different rates from the Western part. And we have the Central Range, which is trends are a little bit different. Southwest and Northeast sort of trends, right? and the Southern Range where we have actually some West to East trending features running through here. One of them is like Marak where, um, where you'll be visiting next coming weeks. Um, here's some, some um, geophysical data actually. Um, this is uh, magnetic data that was acquired and it actually shows us that, um, you know, this same area down to the South over here, we have um, quite a lot of those Southwest and Northeast trending features, right? So it tells us that, that what this is really telling us is that the fabric of the rocks in this area, in this basin, right? Trends in this particular direction. We, tr we try to understand why, right? But it's, it's a very, um, very key feature of, um, of how, the, how Trinidad um, was, um, um, uh, created in the first place and tells us a, a bit about how and why it is the way it is now. When we look at the surface geology map, which is what we were looking at before, um, we actually see those same southwest and northeast features also trending across the area. So we see that the colors on this map, which I'll talk a bit about more in more detail just now, um, actually trend in that same orientation. So it's telling us that something about the, the actual very fabric of what we're standing on um, aligns itself in that sort of orientation, right? Um, what we also know is that the, like the central range area has a lot of folding and those folds decrease in, um, in tightness as you go towards the south. And we also um, can see that the areas of the western part of the northern range They've got really deep valleys cutting in by the waves and stuff now, like Maracas and Las Cuevas and stuff, really nice deep um, large bays, right? Compared to what we have on the eastern side of the northern ranges. And that's uh, got a bit to do with the fact that you can see actually different colors of rocks on either side over here. They're slightly different ages, different kinds of rocks as well too. But it also shows us that one part of the range is actually going down and drowning, right? And one part of the range is actually slightly coming up, right? And that gives us these geomorphological features that, um, that we enjoy, these nice deep bays and stuff. Right, so if we were to just um, quickly fly around a little bit around Trinidad, here are some key features that we have. Right, so like I said, the Northern Range, it's pretty much um, composed of metamorphic rocks. Um, these rocks are fundamentally, I think if you ask anybody, um, the rocks in the Northern Range are fundamentally different from everything else you pretty much see across the entire country, right? And whereas the rest of rocks in the country, um, apart from the few limestones that we have scattered throughout the Central Range and a few in the Southern Range, everything else is pretty much sand and shale, right? So because of that, um, to age date these rocks and dis dis discern these rocks from each other, 
um, we use different methods, right? And these methods um, involve some form of, um, of age dating, um, like using pollen to actually, um, from the rock samples to actually find out what age it is or to even use fossils within the rock, right? Um, you might have heard that we use micro fossils quite a lot throughout um, the oil fields and stuff in Southern Trinidad. And that is what helps us to discern that a particular rock in, let's say on the Western part of Southern Trinidad is different from a particular rock in the um, middle of the central range, even though they may look at, you know, at first sight uh, in, uh, in the field, they may look exactly the same. So the colors that you see on this map are really discerning different ages of rock. And in most cases, the ages of rock are being broken down and separated via microfossils or pollen. The easy um, separation is like the Northern Range where those rocks are very fundamentally different from um, the rest of the country. They are actually quite far traveled, meaning that they weren't really here um, um, compared to the rest of the country. And I'll show you how, how that came about. Um, they were once um, uh, sandstones and shales and even limestones, but they've undergone such deep burial and, and changes in temperatures and stuff that have actually metamorphosed them, right? So they're really um, compacted and they've changed their, their entire fabric, right? Um, as we come across um, the Karani Basin itself, it's a, it's a big bowl. It actually opens out into the Gulf of Paria and the rocks inside there are actually quite benign, quite flat line, right? And there's actually a, a small little gas field here that we'll point out a, a little bit too. Very, very um, uh, um, different type of rocks compared to the Northern Range. These are very, very young. They're all like, uh, like a couple million years old, five to five to um, present day, five million years old to present day, and then uh, they pretty much filled up a bowl, uh, a basin inside here um, as a, a delta, basically a branch of a delta, kind of flowed through here and put those sediments. In the central part of the island, we've got a whole bunch of uplifts. You we'll look at that; that's a fold and truss belt. It's got a lot of deep water deposits and it's like, why is deep water at surface present day? It tells you that a lot, a lot of compression occurred and it lifted up all of these rocks. The oldest rocks within the central and southern part of Trinidad um, occurs at San Fernando Hill and a few other scattered places throughout the central range. And this is where we have rocks which are 65 million years old exposed here. This rock is actually the rock that, when placed at the right temperatures and pressure, expels hydrocarbon, which gives us our, um, what the larger part of our economy for a long period of time in Trinidad. Um, the central range, um, like I said, is really, really folded, whereas the southern basin is pretty much the same thing. It's just that it's part of that, that folded system has now been buried by a river that flowed over and just completely um, hides many of these features that were folded up. So to summarize the complex geology of Trinidad in our one slide, we pretty much started off at the center of a large continental feature called Pangaea. We were really at the heart of it actually about here. At that point in time, here is Trinidad. Here is Florida for reference. Here is the, uh, Cuba and Bahamas. And here is Guinea in Africa and um, Suriname and Demara Plateau, which is an area just offshore Suriname. So you can see that um, you know, many millions of years ago, we were in the center of this whole area, which then basically broke apart and started spreading, right? So we were right in the middle of this whole big spreading area. When a, when a continent starts to break apart, you start to think of like, like East African Rift. That's an area where it is currently breaking apart. 
is forming lakes. Those lakes then open out into the oceans. They, the ocean waters get to come inside of those lakes and changes the whole salinity of those lakes. Those lakes eventually become part of an ocean, a seaway, and then the ocean expands and that gave birth to the Atlantic itself and eventually the Caribbean. So we were really in the heart of that whole break apart system, right? As that era broke apart, it actually created very, very deep water conditions. So not only did it just form a seaway, it actually formed very deep water conditions. And in that deep water conditions, we were able to actually have some rocks that were able to, um, to have store quite a lot of carbon, which then gave us our oil industry, our source rocks, right? So in a very simplistic way, we are composed of a lot of collapsed areas that were formed when you're breaking areas apart, right? So you're pulling them apart and you're creating collapse. And eventually those collapsed areas were then filled up with sediments. About 25 million years ago, we had um, uh, an, a Caribbean plate, which was coming in from the Pacific side. And it basically started to um, compress this area. So the area that was like, like, uh, ex like extended and creating a set of steps collapsing, that area now starts to experience a bulldozer effect. And so what's really gonna happen is that the, each of these steps that collapse is sort of going to reverse and go back upwards. So it inverts, right? As it inverts, each of these steps basically get pushed all the way up. Some of them get pushed all the way up the surface and form hills, mountains, ridges, right? And those are the features that then gave rise to our Northern Range, Central Range and Southern Range. So it's those steps, those large step-like features that, um, that created that in the first place. The opening of each of those steps, each of those steps had that Southwest and Northeast fabric in them. So they were oriented in that way in the first place. So I'm gonna just jump across a little bit to Tobago now because I mean, the talk does include a Tobago. So Tobago has a few pretty cool features. This is uh, the surface geology map of Tobago here shown in 3D. That's Trinidad in the corner over there. Um, what we have is a series of faults running across Tobago. Most of them are called um, uh, strike slip faults in this area. And some of them actually have little bends to them. They don't go straight all the way. They sort of turn and twist, right? Um, so in Tobago, we've got uh, quite an, an active fault system that you know, we tend to have large earthquakes on every now and then. And one of them is the North Tobago Fault where we have a, a hinge occurring over here. And uh, we're gonna talk about this hinge a little bit in more detail coming up. But as you can see over here, this, this map below is actually the same rocks that occur on Tobago, but they're just really far down below the ocean, right? And you can see on them, they're actually like cliff-like features where the falls basically drop areas down significantly. And it's on those, on those um, falls that we actually have those earthquakes. So I've plotted on some of those places where the earthquakes occur. Um, we got um, metamorphic rocks in the northeastern part of Tobago. And through the central Tobago, we have volcanic rocks. And then through the uh, southern part of Tobago, we have mostly sedimentary rocks. And those sedimentary rocks relate to some of the rocks that are explored for over here for hydrocarbon as well too. So we're gonna explore um, by looking at a few key places across Tobago, across the Northern um, Bay, North, North Coast area. Then we kind of come onto Trinidad and look at a few areas around here as well too, and come all the way down to the Southern um, Basin as well. And after that, I'll try to show how all of these places like came to be at different points in time. So going back across to the northern basin, northern north coast area, here's Port of Spain for reference, here's Toko, 
that's the north coast fault zones and stuff running across there pretty much everything to the north is trying to move towards the west and everything um for the, the foot on the southern side is trying to move towards the east so you relatively get that sort of strike slip motion to it um but i guess what catches your eye here is all these red blobs and these are the gas fields that occur um, on the North Coast, and they've actually supplied us with gas for like 20 something years now. Um, these in particular, hibiscus and poinsettia, they're very well known in the oil industry. And there's a pipeline that actually runs from here all the way down to Atlantic LNG out over there. These are all biogenic gas, which means it actually is being generated from the shales in and amongst these sandstones that occur at fairly shallow depths in this area, right? And recently, um, some other gas fields out over here were also being developed. And that's um, further towards the east being developed by Shell. Uh, those extend also into Venezuelan waters. So we've been talking about dragon gas as well too. You might have heard about that in the news and potentially that could be tied back into some of our infrastructure over here. So if we look at this area below the ocean now, what do we see? So here's a seismic section which runs from pretty much offshore Blanche shares all the way through Orchid, which is one of those gas discoveries I talked about. And it runs further through a couple more discoveries further towards the north of Tobago. Um, here is the seabed. It's fairly flat, a little few bumps here and there. And then it gets deeper and deeper and deeper as you go towards the Northeast. I've actually converted this scale here, which is normally shown in time, it's shown here in depth. So this actually is in feet. And so you see the sea, but it's fairly shallow here. It's about 200 or so feet water. Whereas way out over here, it's more like, you know, close to 2000. It's really deep water out near the bagel out here. And, um, and yeah, uh, we actually give this, these seismic sections to like kids in high schools and stuff to actually look at and try to figure out like what's going on. Um, I think you can see some really distinctive breaks occurring like right about here and about there. It looks like it's, you know, just been broken, right? So here, yeah, we have some, some large falls that are actually occurring in this area. And some of these layers, they're actually just representing different types of sediments being laid down. Sand, shales, little bits of limestones and stuff. And all of those are just being layered and layered and layered on top of each other. So you have like 9,000 feet of sediment just laid down inside here, right? So I put on a little bit of interpretation to that. There's some faults. I'm sure you picked up some of those faults yourselves, right? And then here, this is actually a gas sand, right? So, so the orchid gas sands, they occur over here. So that's what people explore for. And then up over here, we also have some more gas sands as well. This one as well too. But look, I note over here that here, we have interbedded shellful sands and muds. Shellful meaning very shallow water. Whereas over here, I'm saying that this is deep water, which is more like the conditions occurring out over here. So how did we go from shallow water to deep water right on top of each other? So it just means that this area right here was not shallow, um, shallow water setting at one point in time. And then many, many millions of years later, it started to experience deeper water conditions. So what could cause that is that if you have a large fall, you just drop the area down, it's actually gonna go from shallow water to a deeper water setting, simply. So we have a fault which is continuously moving, it's still moving today, it's still causing earthquakes, and it's making this area just go down, down, down. And that is what is creating different environments um, in the rock record over here. Um, just to point out this, because I'll show you this in a little bit, um, on the basement, so here, this bright feature, that's actually the top of the, of the metal volcanics and the volcanic rocks down at depth here, 
right? So these are the rocks which are exactly the same, like what we have on top of Tobago, right? Um, like like um, in the Bacolet area or the Black Rock area, Plymouth area, those kinds of rocks. And you can see they're really jagged like, right? And when we actually look at that in more detail and we map those jagged features, what we actually see is we can see evidence of rivers and valleys and meanders. And it's, it's incredible what you can see here. So on top of this volcanic rock, right? When you map this area out, which is just offshore Tobago, you actually see evidence of rivers. And these things may have existed about 5 million years ago, five to 7 million years ago, right? So what we actually worked out here was that there used to actually be another Tobago, another island, right? That was next to Tobago at during this time and was about the same size of Tobago today, right? And this area had rivers flowing north of it, south of it, all kinds of things, right? So we were able to like, delineate this feature. Tobago is quite interesting. Huh? Tobago actually does not share much of a geological history with us. It started off way out here, whereas much of Trinidad started out way out over here, north of South America. So it was pretty far away from us. It's close to where Panama was, uh, is today. It was part of that arc system with um, the other islands like Bonaire, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, the ABC islands. So it shares a lot of geology with them. They're part of a Cretaceous arc. So 65 million years ago, there was a volcanic arc. That was Tobago and his brothers and sisters, right? That area got broken apart and plastered onto the side of South America. So you have all of those islands sort of plastered onto the Northern part of South America now. And Tobago was, the, was the one of those islands that happened to reach all the way and meet the rest of Trinidad here today. So when we look at, um, at where Trinidad is now and where Tobago is now, and we go back 6 million years ago to where Trinidad was and where Tobago was, there was actually another little island out over here, which we named Isla de la Asuncion after one of the islands that Columbus had thought he was going to call Tobago. And um, yeah, so it shows us that, you know, things actually change quite a lot in geological time. Places could be com could completely disappear, right? So just jumping around Tobago, uh, a few um, key stops, um, just to point out like on the north coast of Tobago and the metamorphic rocks, we have Lots of folding occurring inside there. The rocks have undergone a lot of folding. Those, those are like uh, volcanic and metamorphic rocks inside it that's folded up. So we can see some nice folds out in Englishman's Bay. You come down to um, Plymouth, you'll actually see um, some dikes. These dikes are basically where you know lava is basically coming up and running through and and basically piercing through layers of rock. And you get these nice dikes um, running across the rocks inside here. Um, so that's some of the volcanics example. And then you look across over here on bottom picture and you see some nice barnacle beds inside here. And so these are actually uh, part of the Rockley Bay area on the south coast, some sedimentary rocks where you have barnacles and gastropods and stuff trying to live on onto the volcanic rocks. And they're basically forming new sediments and stuff inside here. We actually found shark teeth and stuff inside here as well too, quite, quite interesting stuff. And here's just relating how Tobago looks like with respect to what's offshore, right? So we have all this volcanic igneous rocks and stuff all the way down here. These are the buried islands and stuff. And then all of this sediment, 9,000 feet of sediment was in place on top of that. Right, so I'm now gonna jump across over to Trinidad. So what a better place to start in Trinidad than a nice viewpoint. So here's San Fernando Hill. San Fernando Hill is right in the center of the central range area itself. And we get a nice view to the south, to the north of here, just, 
a brilliant spot, right? Um, here, like I said, it's pretty ashes rocks, 65 million years old kind of stuff. Um, this is a rock that really produces the oil for us. Um, on this northwest to southeast cross section, that rock is actually expressed here as this green layer. Now you can see that most places, the green layer is actually really deep, like way, way buried down below all of this other stuff, right? Um, in the central range and also in the southern range, it actually comes up a bit higher and pushed up. And San Fernando Hill is one of those places where it actually got pushed all the way up to surface, right? So that's um, the Cretaceous rocks being exposed at surface. Now, in most places where it's actually still way deeply buried down, the rocks there are undergoing such high temperatures and pressures that it's actually expelling hydrocarbon from itself, right? And that hydrocarbon then comes up into other layers, which we would drill and, ex and extract that hydrocarbon. But you might notice that if you look to the north here, in the Karani Basin, you don't quite see that green layer showing on inside here. And that's because from the rock record, from numerous drills made in this area, those rocks have not been found actually inside here. And actually that's one of the reasons put forward as to why we don't actually have oil fields in the Karani Basin area itself. So the geology here is quite different from what occurs in South. And you can see that you have much more horizontally layered beds inside here, whereas in the south it's really, really folded up and kind of stuff, right? So let's jump across to the Karani Basin. So here's a seismic line that actually runs through the Karani Basin, starting pretty much from like Freeport, and it goes all the way to um, the Mahika area, um, uh, all, the, all the way towards the east itself, right? So it's kind of west to east. And we're starting from Freeport on this side. And what we see inside here is, well, I think you could appreciate that it, there is a lot of horizontality in these layers. You can actually still see layers going across and across. They're, yeah, they're chopped up. Yeah, there's they're some faults and stuff, but it's not like really folded up and stuff, right? It's not that complex really, but there's some crazy things going on down on the bottom over here as well, right? So I've just pointed out some faults there for you. There are some areas where we have a lot of sediment, right? And this here is actually in time. And down to these depths, you're talking like 20,000 feet and stuff inside here, right? But there's some pretty interesting layers um, being chopped by these faults inside here. And here, is actually that little gas field, the Mahika gas field, that has produced actually a fair amount of gas from, from this little um, folded little feature inside here, right? So no one's really explored elsewhere to see if they find anything else inside here. So that's interesting. Jumping up to the Northern Range a little bit. So a lot of you all might have gone to this place. This is, I love this spot, Tururi, right? It's, um, it's pretty much like uh, an area where we have um, re-precipitation of calcium carbonate. Now, why I say re-precipitation? Up in the mountains of the Northern Range, like I said, we have not only sandstones and shales and stuff metamorphosed, we also have limestones. So those limestones are metamorphosed as well. And we, uh, one of those limestones called the Quar limestone, which occurs just upstream of the Tururé water steps. So here's um, one of those hiking trails for Tururé. It starts over here, crosses a few little rivers. You walk in the river in some places and eventually get to the water steps right about here. And along the way, I think you reach one of these junctions here where you clearly were in a river where there's no sign of of um, tufa limestone, and then you enter a river, a branch of the river with a lot of tufa limestone. And that's the, these branches up here where they, they come down from the, um, the limestone area. So those limestones are being dissolved in the water. They come down in the water. Uh, the water is now super saturated with them. And any change in, abrupt change in um, gradient in the streams with 
um, cause uh, precipitation along with uh, other microbial uh, factors which help that, right? Um, and actually the, the, the stream gradients tend to change where there's like a fault twisting and turning um, the rocks in the area, which allows for those faults that could be created. So that's quite, quite interesting. But again, all of these rocks are about Jurassic in age and there are limestones that are then being re-precipitated at further areas downstream. And they, are, you know, they build out wood um, over time. So it's quite interesting how they build. Uh, they would have only started to form when the northern range had to have been uplifted high enough to actually start to form rivers in the first place. So it's quite interesting for us to like study this and figure out, well, when did this actually start? Um, how many millions of years ago? Gonna jump across now to the Piparo mud volcano. So at Piparo, this is located in the central part of the island, that occurs along a fold, which actually forms you know, um, the San Fernando Hill feature as well. So like I said, San Fernando Hill has been like pushed up, right? Same kind of mechanism occurs over here as well too. There's actually a bend in the fault. And in this bend, as the area has been compressed, and, um, being, and motion is like being directed in a sort of easterly direction. It forces that bend to be pushed up. So here, here are my steps that were created way back in, you know, in the Cretaceous and stuff. Those areas are then being filled with some sediments. And here is that fault, which then bends. And as we try to compress this area, push this area like this, pushes this bend up, right? So that creates this pop-up sort of feature. It's concentrating all of the deformation into that area. What we were able to, to do in Piparo was to look below it a little bit. So we were able to like look below Piparo and see what is it really made of. Um, the, this is a resistivity line. It lights up with you know, warm colors where there's um, sandstones with fresh water, right? And you get um, cool um, colors where you have shales with, uh, with, with less, right? Um, and so uh, this is the area that actually occurs at the throat of the volcano itself. So we actually were able to like make cross sections of the, the volcano and see how the, the mechanism, the conduit for the volcano changed throughout time. I remember um, back in 2019, we had actually some activity going on at the volcano with all these fractures forming across it and stuff. And what we were able to see when we ran one of these lines was that the, the area that was uh, the, the conduit actually moved and it twisted. So we had some previous earthquakes and stuff um, they only lead up to that. And that then most likely would have allowed for the uh, fault itself, the conduit, to actually twist and turn, which then caused some activity and bursting activity as well to over here. Jumping across to like the southern part of Trinidad, a really folded up sort of area. So this is a, a typical line that I lecture and teach my students with. Um, here we're exploring the oil fields going from the Debe area, Pinal, Barco, into Mon Diablo and Rock Dome to the south. And what we see on this is some, you don't see much, but you see some features. Uh, it's folded. It's a much harder line to interpret compared to the ones I showed you before. You might see some horizontality in here. That's where you have like a bowl, a syncline, right? But you have some um, crystal-like features inside here, which are anticlines. And all of these are wells that have been drilled to, um, to explore for those different layers uh, and types of rock. Most of the um, wells drilled inside here target uh, a particular sandstone that's uh, about 14 to 11 million years old, it's the mid Miocene Herrera sandstones. And those occur down at depth over here. 
and they're folded up there also in recumbent folds and stuff. And uh, yeah, they, they're usually charged with hydrocarbon inside here. Way further down, there's a well uh, called Rocky Palace, which was drilled by Exxon on the rock road. And they drilled all the way down to the Cretaceous. So this is the same rocks that form San Fernando Hill. They occur way down over here at 16,000 feet below the ground, right? So some really nice folds up features and that's how the hydrocarbon actually gets up and trapped inside here. Nice folds to trap the hydrocarbon, nice folds to get the oil up. And we have quite a lot of stratigraphy to drill through to get to it. So Penal was an area that was really explored um, because of hydrocarbon seeps. Like literally there was seeps and sandstones just filled with oil throughout the area. So people started poking and poking deeper and deeper until they would have gotten to like the Herreras and stuff. But some er other areas which are quite obvious seeps is like the Pitch Lake. And I know you all had a talk about the Pitch Lake uh, some time ago. Um, just to point out that, you know, it's quite, um, quite uh, a massive oil seep. Um, pretty much here, the Cretaceous rock, the same rock that is expelling all of this oil has actually been lifted up quite high. It occurs at just, just be beyond 5,000 feet below the ground from where these folks are standing, right? And on top of it, a lot of actual um, other layers of rock are actually missing. So it's not really well sealed up inside here. There are, there are a lot of sands actually covering it and you don't have much shales covering it completely. And that and the fact that there are lots of other faults in the air, it allows for this hydrocarbon to actively just come all the way up to surface, which creates, yes, the largest natural seep in the world. Talking about seeps, another seep that we have um, occurs in the Guayaguari forest. And this seep is what we refer to as a salt spring feature. So taking you down to the, to the southeast part of the island, which is here, right? Um, we have a, a clearing in the forest where you have two full limestones across um, uh, uh, quite a large area. And you got salt water flowing down over this hillside. Um, and you also have, and the water is also very hot. It's 40 degrees Celsius. So it's quite a unique feature. It's a seep, it's a salt water seep, 20 something miles from the coast, has nothing to do with present day sea water or anything. It's water trapped in the rocks way deep down that's actually coming up the surface. And that water flows down this hillside. As it flows, it then precipitates limestone. So it tells us that somewhere down there, there's also limestone. Um, it's, so it's very rich in carbonate, right? And the salinity is um, 16 to 23,000 parts per million. So that's you know, really high salinity. That's kind of like um, uh, seawater, right? And the water also is 40 degrees Celsius at um, surface where, where it's coming out. So it's quite hot. So it means it's coming from quite deep. So it's coming up and just flowing out on surface, just like the pitch lake, but mostly water, right? There is some oil in, in it as well too. Uh, we even see like oils and stuff being trapped in the rocks present day um, by it. We see evidence of limestones. We see something we call cave pearls, which are Feet are notorious features which form when you have limestones exposed and stuff. Um, luckily, there's another Exxon well that was actually drilled nearby. Um, this well was drilled about a kilometer away, and this is called uh, Iguana River. So this salt spring feature is here, right? Let me just move this. And the well is by that star over there. And what it actually showed us was that um, we have very young rocks, mostly sandstones and stuff, um, overlying Cretaceous, which tells us there's a huge feature we call an unconformity. Unconformity means a break in deposition, actually a lack of deposition, due most likely due to 
uplift and exposure, right? So it tells us that once upon a time, this area was below the ocean, got lifted up, got exposed, and then at a subsequent time, many millions of years later, was then put below the ocean again. So this, tell, this well tells us that that area actually got exposed quite a long time ago, um, sometime even after the Cretaceous. And then it was ex covered up um, just about 8 million years ago. Changing environments. So um, on the East Coast, uh, there are some places that you might have heard about coals and lignites and coal mines and stuff, right? Um, there's a place down in Mayara called uh, the Palm East area where we, uh, we study these coals a bit. So we have um, sandstones down here, a dramatic change with, um, with lignites and coals on top of it. And these are basically formed in a, in a very much um, a low oxygenated environment, such as a swamp, right? So pretty much we're, we're taking an area that had marine sands, shallow marine sands, just like just offshore kind of, kind of sea waters and stuff. And then you're just taking your, your swamp and put, putting it on top of that. So it tells you that there's a really dramatic change in, um, in what, was a, what happened here. So again, uh, a pretty abrupt change, again, uh, some sort of uh, conformity as well too. Interestingly, on the top part of this, um, no longer really uh, exists there, but on the top part of this, there used to actually be tree roots um, in place at the top, um, preserved as, as lignites. And that was, that was quite interesting. So we still see some, some evidence of the poorly branches and stuff of these trees that would have fallen into the swamp and get preserved. Um, but uh, our crops are not necessarily preserved in Trinidad, right? So most of them occur because of quarrying and, and, and that's and land clearing for buildings. So this area is still actively being cleared uh, for development and stuff, but it is uh, quite an interesting site. Um, I hope they, they leave some of it for us to continue to, to look at. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a last uh, feature that we would have um, all heard of um, and seen on the news and stuff um, not too long ago. So back in 2018, we had a, a large earthquake uh, which shook the island, damaged parts of Port of Spain and stuff, those buildings. But then you saw footage in the news of the low zero area being affected. So here's one of those dramatic faults we see through the low zero area over here where one of the agriculture roads was then uh, completely offset. For scale, that's us standing there, right? Really large offsets on these faults. Uh, so here we had some large um, slip offsets, whereas over here we had a, um, the, the entire area, this guy's garden basically dropped by more than 20 feet um, from where it used to be, right? Really nice um, slip over here, which um, unfortunately um, made his access to his place a, a lot more difficult. It caused such a slip that the entire um, area that cascaded down to the, to the sea and lifted up the, um, the, the, the beach area. It lifted up the beach area so instantaneously that the sands actually that was on the beach remained uh, pretty much intact. And you can see the, the older rocks below um, pushed up. We were able to like drone map this feature um, to see you know, what it looked like from a bigger perspective. And we saw like a big fault running through over here. Nice um, left lateral fault is shifting like that across the area. And then we have this area inside here, which is really just slipping. It pushed the coastline out by 106 meters in this area. And so, um, you know, most people started thinking, well, it was a, a simple landslide. Um, and yeah, this part of it actually behaves like a landslide, but it doesn't quite explain what's going on further up over there. 
So we started like um, uh, monitoring it and we saw that this area continued to slip, continue to slip over time. But the areas further up over here um, had no head scar, like a typical landslide. And just, yeah, just for scale, that's us sitting on one of those small breaks along the road, just about over there. Um, so some years later, or one year later, actually, um, the areas at the top of the uh, fault scar, uh, we, where, where the offset of the road used to be, um, was fixed by the Ministry of Works. So just kind of smoothed it out. And then you had the appearance of mud volcanoes across this area. So it tells you that, you know, there are some deeper seated faults in this area, which basically move and that caused the, um, the, the mud volcanoes to come up. The mud that's coming up, we've been told from some paleontologists that it's actually from you know, rocks that are as deep as 8,000 feet below the ground. So it's quite significant faults that, um, and plumbing system that allows for those rocks to migrate up with fluids all the way up to surface. So I'm just gonna try to summarize the last 100 million years in a couple of pictures here. We had Tobago, which is really far away, far traveled, like I said, was pretty much where Panama is now. Then the Northern Range, then the Central Range, and then Southern Trinidad, which pretty much is almost in situ, always pretty much been here. So if we go back in time to um, 65 million years ago, we would have had you know, those limestones and stuff already put into the Northern Range, which would eventually form two Ray, right? And then out in Trinidad over here, we're pretty much experiencing deep water conditions. This is what the coastline would have looked like of South America on a schematic, very cartoon like um, um, set I'm showing you here, right? We jump forward in time to about 34 million years ago. We have Tobago and that, um, its sister island um, out of the water, been pushed all the way up the surface and exposed. Um, the Northern Range is um, still partially below the, the waters. Um, we have deep water conditions still going on in the central and southern part of Trinidad. And those southern part of Trinidad, um, Salt Spring area may have been uplifted, forming some caves and stuff, little island system maybe. There's definitely some limestones and stuff inside there. And jumping forward to 25 million years ago, the Northern Range gets pushed up. Tobago is um, hanging out next to the Northern Range up here. Uh, we would have then started to form the two area water steps as the landmass comes up, rivers start to form and cut into it. And then the central range is still undergoing deep water conditions. Some deep water sands like the Nariva sands would have been put in here. Those sands would then trap the waters that we would see at Piparo, which would then give rise to the mud and the mud volcano itself. And then about 12 million years ago, a lot of more areas got pushed up, right? We had the Northern Range up, Tobago up, Central Range, uh, most of it been lifted up. And parts of the Southern Range also, also um, been lifted up. And we're putting the Herrera sands inside here, which form um, those uh, exploration features in Southern Trinidad that we explore for. And then jumping forward to 6 million years ago, um, the western part in northern range starts to go down, eastern part in northern range starts to go up. So we start to form like Maracas and Las Cuevas and stuff, form those bays, right? Um, the island off of Tobago, its sister, starts to go down. So it starts to be drowned. Tobago remains up. The folding of the central range continues. So the southern part of Trinidad, which was a little island for a long period of time, now drowns. And um, deep water conditions in this area is um, coming to an end. Um, the deltas from Venezuela are marching towards Trinidad, filling up this space. And basically that is going to help push all of the Cretaceous rocks deep enough to start to commence hydrocarbon. So we will start to pre um, begin seeps forming like the pitch lake and stuff. So the delta now migrates all the way across. This is 2 million years ago. Most of Trinidad is now connected up together. The Northern Range is connecting to the, to the Carney Basin. 
connecting to the center range, connected to Southern Trinidad. The Bago is almost where it needs to be. Um, we start to generate gas in the Northern area. Um, we have strike slip motion occurring in the central range, which causes Piparo to be compressed, focused, mud starts to come out. Um, the Southern range is now uplifted again. It is exposed. Seeps start to occur. Uh, the tufa starts to be deposited out at um, Salt Spring. The coal beds are deposited because of the changing environments from marine to um, marine to, to mangrove and back again. And so this delta migrates to and over um, Trinidad a couple of times um, before it retreats to where it is present day. So that concludes my um, George Gall talk of Trinidad. I uh, just leave you with a quote of, you know, um, I think geologists and geographers share one thing in common. We're quite inquisitive and quite inquisitive about the environment. And so there's always um, something to discover out there. So um, happy exploring. Thanks.